All right, as you guys may know, we're walking through an eight-week series showcasing God's design for human bodies and how we relate to our bodies. And we aren't quite at the end of the series because the next two weeks we'll talk about how do we walk as faithful Christians marked by Christ's love in a world of much confusion and pain and disagreement about these issues. But before we get there, today we're going to kind of close the conceptual loop that we've been pulling through the series so far. If you remember back in the first week, we started off with some foundational questions. Questions like, what is the human body for? What is its purpose? You can use it to do lots of things, but what was it designed for? And then we asked, to whom does your body belong to? And one of the follow-up questions to that was that, If you would say, duh, my body belongs exclusively to me, then what about after you die? Who does it belong to then? Because as we see in the chapter we were in last week, Genesis 3, sin has enormous consequences in our desires, in our world, and even in our bodies. And Genesis 3.19 says, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So today we're going to be looking at that great consequence of sin, the end of the story of our actual bodies, death and what comes after. A little over 20 years ago, I I had my first significant loss, my first run-in with the end of the story for our bodies. John Norman Melton was my grandfather, my next-door neighbor, a second father to me whose home was virtually inseparable from my own home, maybe 70 yards away. In fact, I actually have an old map. Uh, This is from 1968. I found it and printed it off from my grandmother last year. It's the the land that my grandfather bought that I grew up on. And you can see his name written at the top, John Norman, because back in the day, I guess that's all you could do to to show that you owned land is write your name on a map. Um, But I thought this was so cool uh, from 1968. And he would build a house in the middle of those trees, and then my parents would build a house later on. And that's, that's the land that I grew up on. Um, often in the woods, in the creek, in the pasture, as much as I was indoors, and often at my grandparents' house. And I still remember his laugh with perfect clarity over 20 years later. He had this infectious, rumbling, bouncing laugh, hoarse and raspy from far too many cigarettes. He was one of the toughest and hardest working men I've ever known, never taking a day off from GE, saving up all of his vacation days until December when I would go with him out into the pasture way back there and we would select an oak tree to chop down for wood for the winter. We'd tie a very long rope to the tree and the other end to his Z71 and then we'd chainsaw that sucker down to a small earthquake on our land. And then we'd spend the next few days sawing and splitting that wood, an activity I'd argue is still some of the best therapy money can buy, amen? And have plenty of wood stacked up for the winter. So it was very odd to me when I came home from high school baseball practice one day to hear that the small lung biopsy he'd done didn't go as planned. And he was having another procedure done the following day. His strong 60-year-old body didn't jive well with hospital rooms. It just didn't fit the vibe. And the discrepancy grew the next day as he never woke up from his procedure and our family gathered around the body of our beloved patriarch. And I'll tell you, it was in that moment that I first felt the weight of that question, to whom does your body belong to ultimately? Will there be anyone strong and kind enough to take responsibility for the body of my grandfather? This ending to the story of his existence felt so wrong, so it left me wondering, will there be another chapter? It's a question and a weight I've felt many more times since then. When I ponder about my own existence, I feel far more mortal than I did in high school, and it's the question that our passage today is going to thoroughly answer. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 together. We're going to be covering a lot of ground today, literally a whole chapter, so I hope you ate your Wheaties this morning. I hope you had some coffee or slept in the Holiday Inn Express. We will move quickly through portions and then camp out on some others. And we'll start in verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 15. It 
This is Paul speaking, and he says, Now I would remind you, brothers, that's gender inclusive, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So Paul says the gospel, the good news of Jesus' perfect life, death, and triumphant resurrection is both, one, something they received, past tense, and two, is something they will stand in and are being saved by in a present, ongoing way. Verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. As you may know, Paul was a Pharisee who persecuted the church before God blinded him and saved him on the road to Damascus. Verse 10, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether it was whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. So Paul talks about the gospel as of first importance, the highest value in the life of a Christian. And this passage reminds me of the Martin Luther quote where he says this, the truth of the gospel is the principal article of all Christian doctrine. Most necessary is it that we know this article well, teach it to others, and beat it into their heads continually. He wasn't a guy to mince words, evidently. Uh, He knew how to use a hammer both physically and verbally to get his point across, and he's not wrong on this. If you've ever been hearing a sermon here and you've heard, you know, I've heard this whole gospel thing before, that's a good thing, not a bad thing, okay? It's a good thing. This is the process we all need to get the good news of Jesus beat into our heads continually in the most loving way imaginable. And he lays out the facts of the gospel. Jesus died for sins. He was buried. He was raised on the third day. He appeared to Peter, the 12, his closest disciples, then to a crowd of 500 eyewitnesses, then James, then Paul himself. And this simple, straightforward unpacking of the gospel leads us into our focus for today. Look at verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. So in the church in Corinth, there were people who wrongly said, there is no bodily resurrection from the dead. They were like, guys, come on. That's a fanciful idea. It's Sure, it's nice and all, but it's just not possible. We all know that dead people stay dead. And Paul simply asks, well, wait, if there is no resurrection, then you're saying Jesus hasn't been raised. Verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. So if there is no bodily resurrection, and Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then Paul's preaching, and all of our faith is in vain, void of truth, its purpose, meaningless. Verse 15, we are found even to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. So Not only is our preaching in vain and our faith in vain, but also that would mean we're liars who are misrepresenting God himself. Verse 16, For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. So Paul continues his argument with them. He says, If there is no bodily resurrection and Christ has not been raised, then you are still dying in your sin. The root problem in your soul is not dealt with. He gives another problem in verse 18. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Those who died believing in Christ, they're lost. They're gone forever. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. So the summary, if Jesus only gives us hope for a better life here and now, and the resurrection is not true, we are to be pitied most of all humans. Paul says, if there is no bodily resurrection, then Jesus hasn't been raised. And if Jesus hasn't been raised, then spiritually speaking, we are the equivalent of someone who invested their entire life savings and retirement with Bernie Madoff. And now there's nothing there. Or for the youths who don't know Bernie Madoff, it'd be like if you've YOLO'd it all into Dogecoin in the crypto exuberance of 2021. 
But now that Jerome Powell has turned off the money printer and raised rates to the gills to destroy inflation, you are making peace with living in your parents' basement for the foreseeable future and maybe forever. If I were to put a modern spin on this argument, I'd say if Christ was not raised and therefore the dead are not raised, what are we doing here? Why are we here? Why on earth are we gathered here on a beautiful fall Sunday studying an ancient book? Let's leave right now, like seriously. Like go get brunch next door. Go to the river or park. Take a weekend drive to Asheville or Charleston. Fill ourselves with whatever desires we have and try to stave off depression as long as we can. But don't worry, Paul has good news to that thought. Verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Christ has been raised, and he's just the first. All who are saved by faith in him will also be raised. He went first on this dramatic journey of redemption. He experienced the punishment of sin and the despair of death so that he could defeat them both, and he made a way for the rest of us in Christ to follow him out of the darkness of death. Amen? so that my grandfather could follow, so that you could follow, so that I will follow one day. And he makes this beautiful statement, verse 21, for as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. As we've mentioned throughout, we live in a broken world. We've inherited death from our first great-great-grandfather, Physical death, spiritual death. Our physical bodies are broken. They, they die. Our relationships with our bodies are broken. We sin spiritually. We, we die spiritually. But here's the marvelous parallel. As in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. As by one man came death, so by one man has come resurrection from the dead. Jesus came to fix every problem Adam created and reverse the curse of sin and save those who are united to him in faith. In verse 30, Paul picks up a new riff on his earlier argument of if there is no bodily resurrection, then he applies it in some different ways to some current hardships they were facing. So pick up in verse 30. Why are we in danger every hour? I I protest, brothers, but my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So as we said last week, there are costs to following Jesus. We lay down our sinful desires. We trust God with them. We pursue and follow Jesus instead of our fleshly desires. And then sometimes, for some context, there is also more persecution involved. For us today, it's mostly that people just think we're weird or regressive. But for Paul's day, there was actual physical danger in following Jesus. People in power who might kill you for your faith long before the freedom of religion was established. And there's reason to believe he's actually referencing confrontation with evil humans in Ephesus that he refers to as wild beasts, but actual encounters with with wild beasts was one tactic of persecution, where Christians who refused to recant would be released into a coliseum and mauled by lions or other wild animals. One famous martyr in church history was Perpetua, a young mother who died in just such a setting. And needless to say, Paul, from his a historical vantage point is saying, if there is no resurrection, why in the world would I do all this hard stuff? Why would I put my life at risk? Why live in danger? Why endure all that we're going through? And here he has a new conclusion. If there is no resurrection, if this life is all there is, then eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. This is all there is, so just don't say no to your desires. Feed them, enjoy them. Relish it. This is all there is. And I'd just like to quickly note here that, that sometimes cultural disagreements over sexuality and gender issues are often actually disagreements about resurrection. Because if resurrection isn't a thing, do whatever you want. Don't let anyone stand in your way, because all this is all there is. But if resurrection is coming, then the math totally changes. If this life is a blip in light of eternity, it changes everything. 
Verse 33, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor as is right and do not go on sinning for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. So now Paul's warning them, don't get fooled. An idolatrous focus on this life as the source of ultimate joy reveals a lack of knowledge of God. Wake up. Don't waste your life chasing one whim of desire to the next. And from here on out, he's going to get more and more specific about the nature of the bodily resurrection. Verse 35. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. The implication is that the person referenced here is not asking this question as a serious question of curiosity, but more likely one who denies the resurrection and is mocking Paul. So Paul rebukes them as being foolish. And then he continues with a really helpful and clarifying analogy comparing our bodies to seeds. He says, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. So Paul picks up on a metaphor Jesus uses in John 12. The basic idea is that unless a seed is buried in the ground and dies, it remains alone. It fails to live up to its purpose. It fails to bear fruit. It's wasted. Jesus says that's true of our lives. They're best lived being given away. And Paul picks up this metaphor and he shifts it in a different direction and applies it to our bodies. We are embodied and yet our bodies are dying. But Paul says, yes, the body that you sow is not what it is to be. It is a bare kernel, a seed compared to the entire plant. It's poetic, figurative language to say that the body you're in now is much smaller than it is to become. It's lesser. The same way a seed is lesser than the whole plant once it has grown. He keeps going in this direction in verse 38. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So he's continuing this comparison, and he says, God gave different kinds of bodies to different kinds of beings, different kinds of bodies, a.k.a. seeds for different plants, different humans, animals, birds, fish, heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but different glories for each. He takes all these images of different bodies, greater and lesser glories, and applies it to the resurrection of our bodies in verse 42. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, then there is also a spiritual body. If I could summarize those verses, I might say it like this. If you are in Christ, everything you hate about your body, everything that causes you insecurity, your dishonorable, sinful desires, your weaknesses, any disease, injury, dysfunction, ache, pain, wrinkle, roll, scar, insufficiency, none of that goes with you into the new spiritual body you will be resurrected with. Your body that goes in the ground, it's perishable. It's dying. Your resurrection body, imperishable. No longer breaking down. Revelation 21 tells us this correlates to no more sickness, no more death, no more pain, no more crying, no more bodily disintegration, no more terrible life-altering phone calls. Pick the symptom you want to get rid of. Allergies, gone. Your resurrection body doesn't have them. Back pain, gone. Migraines, gone. Your body that dies is sown in dishonor. Your new body will be raised in glory. Your body that dies is sown in weakness. It dies by failing, by giving out on you. Your new body will be raised in power. How many times have you gotten frustrated with yourself about your weakness of all different kinds? Where you come face to face with your annoying physical limitations and just want to scream. Where you're in a situation where your emotional immaturity and weakness gets put on display for others to see, and you long for an out-of-body experience so you can escape your immaturity. 
where your spiritual weakness gets the best of you once again? Have you ever put your foot in your mouth, said the thing you didn't mean to say, didn't want to say, and seen the pain it caused to others? Can you imagine a new body to match your new heart and new mind with no more sin, no more weakness, the power to live into your best, most heroic, most virtuous desires always, the power to live as you've always wanted to live but never been able to fully? In some way, shape, or form, your resurrection body is the promise that no unmet desire, no pain of longing will ultimately be left. Romans 8 says the glory of bodily resurrection will be so great that the suffering of this world won't even be worth comparing or considering anymore. Every tear known and carefully wiped away by our loving Father, every sacrifice counted as worth it. Verse 45, thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a life-living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is the first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. So he brings back this parallel between Adam and Christ, and he says, here's the reality. We're all born in the image of the man of dust. We've born the reality of life in a growing but then decaying body. But for all those who are in Christ, there is a coming resurrection where all fullness will come, where we'll bear the image of the man of heaven, a perfect spiritual body like his. Verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. How exactly is this going to work? We don't know. He said it's a mystery. We don't know exactly how, but we know it's true that on Christ's second return, there is a change coming, a new, imperishable, immortal body. And this reality has one last overarching glory that's the pinnacle of all the others. Here's how Paul ends his argument. Verse 54, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the sting that I felt standing over my grandfather all those years ago. And the sting I've felt so many other times since. The sting of death is so very painful and the word sting feels really appropriate. Grief throbs and it pierces and it numbs. And death mocks us with its certainty and its relentlessness. The way it pries life from our precious bodies far too fast or sometimes painfully slow. So I've always taken comfort in the fact that Hebrews calls death God's enemy. And I take joy in the fact that these verses boldly reverse roles in the mocking. Instead of death mocking us, Scripture mocks death in the end. Death, where is your victory that was so sure? Where is your sting that pierced us for so long? What this chapter teaches us is that you don't bury Christians, you plant them, amen? You plant them. Because our graves will turn into gardens and there's not a pine box on this planet that could stop the seeds of our bodies from bursting forth into imperishable, glorious, resurrected bodies. There are no nails strong enough. There is no cement thick enough to do that. And one of my favorite things about Jesus' earthly ministry is that he's, you know, kind of like the model for us pastors and all. Yet he never did a funeral. Everyone he went to, he raised the person from the dead. 
He hates funerals as much as we do, and he will raise those of us in Christ to new embodied eternal life on a renewed heaven and earth to reign and rule with him forever. So we've covered a lot of ground today, an entire chapter of scripture almost. I think you guys should get a reward or something maybe. I think that's how that works. We just have one verse left, and I'd like to draw a few takeaways for what all this means for us out of that concluding verse, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So what does the end of the story of our bodies give us? Number one, abiding strength and perseverance. It says, be steadfast, be immovable. Two words, almost synonyms in Greek. They both mean fixed in your place, anchored, unmoving. I don't know all the ways that your life and your body and your soul will experience breakdown here on this planet. I don't know the exact shape of each unmet desire you wrestle with. I don't know the, the silent tears that you cry at night that only Jesus hears, the prayers and unspoken groans of your soul as you struggle and at times fail to be what you desire to be. I have no idea how strong or weak the pressure to give up is for you this morning. I don't know how the, the enemy might be whispering to you and, and saying, do you really think it's worth it? Like, why keep fighting? Just give in. There's no end in sight. Just live your best life here and now. Nothing else matters. Those things may land heavily on you right now, but what I do know is that the resurrection of Jesus is coming and the future hope of your own offers you a very compelling reason to follow Jesus no matter what. They offer you a steadfast source of perseverance. No matter your physical, spiritual, or emotional scars, there's coming a day, if you are in Christ, where you will put on the imperishable, where your new resurrection body will radiate with the glory of perfection. And that can give you an abiding strength and perseverance and power in the here and now that's well beyond your own strength and your own ability to persevere on your own. So instead of the enemy's lies, I want you to hear this morning that if you are in Christ, the resurrection is coming. And as surely as Jesus is alive, it is coming. So hold fast to Christ as he holds fast to you. And here's why I bring this up. My perception is that our culture isn't great at making very strong and powerful people. Our culture is in many ways addicted to comfort, convenience, cowardice even producing people lacking the ability to weather storms, to handle disagreement and pressure. And Jesus wants something better for you, for us. He wants you to be steadfast, immovable, to know what you believe and why, to be able to laugh at the days to come, no matter how good or bad the days you're living in right now happen to be, no matter how applauded or despised your beliefs are today, to be immovable. And then lastly, this offers us unfailing hope. Paul says the promise of the glory of the resurrection to come is our assurance that none of our labor in this life is in vain. Your labor for your family and friends to know Jesus, your labor to remain near to Jesus, abiding with him regardless of whatever pain you're enduring, your work to fight your own besetting sin and desires, your labor to open your hands on your unmet desires. Paul says none of it will be in vain. None of it will be empty. One of my favorite champions of the hope of resurrection um, is Johnny Erickson Tata. Johnny was 17 years old when she dove into a lake not knowing its depth and her neck broke and she became a quadriplegic. And God used that catastrophe to open her eyes to himself. And since then, she's dedicated her life to helping others find hope in Christ by talking about her own suffering. She's written books and given so many talks. And her first book was an autobiography, and she recounts a moment not long after her accident where she was in church, and she saw everyone around her kneeling in prayer. And she was overwhelmed and crushed with despair as she thought, I'll never be able to kneel again. And then she writes, I remembered the kingdom resurrection. Just before the party gets going in heaven, the wedding feast of the Lamb, the first thing I plan to do on my resurrected legs is to drop on grateful, glorified knees, kneel quietly before the feet of Jesus, and then I'm going to be on my feet dancing. 
She says, can you imagine the hope that this gives to someone with a permanent spinal cord injury? Can you imagine the hope this even gives to one who is a manic depressive? No other religion promises new bodies, a material new universe. Only in the gospel of Christ do people hurting like me find such enormous hope to live. I want us to be marked with that kind of hope, a hope that never runs out, that triumphs over the daily tragedies of life, that is greater than the unexpected blows we experience in life or the slow march of aging and what it does to us. This weekend, I was in the upstate with my, my grandmother. I call her Mima, the wife of my grandfather I talked about earlier. And she's about to turn 80. She still lives in the same house, deals with fibromyalgia and a lot of pain in her legs. And at one point this weekend, I walked by her and I said, Mima, do you need anything? And she said, yeah, new legs. <coughs> and I nodded knowingly and didn't say anything. And then she looked down and she said, one day I'll have new legs. And I said, Yes. Yes, you will. Yes, we will, who are united to Christ by faith. We will have new legs free of pain, new backs that do not hurt, new minds free from the pain of mental illness, new arms that don't grow weak or frail, new feet that run across this remade earth to our resurrected Savior who conquered the great enemies of sin and death. Amen. And we will say with him, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting?